Tyler, let's talk about Tellurian. I think the last time we talked about Tellurian, you didn't have gray hair. It's probably true. That's the last time we talked about it on a video for sure. But you and I first started talking about Tellurian years ago at this point. For those that don't know, Tellurian is still a liquefied natural gas export startup. Still a startup after all of these years, Tyler. Yeah, it was a startup because it wanted to do a very unconventional thing. And the person that was in charge of doing that unconventional thing isn't there anymore. So maybe things are going to change now. If you're interested in Tellurian, we're going to talk about where the company's been, where it is right now, and what we expect going forward. I'm Jason Hall. This is Investing Unscripted. And this video is sponsored by The Motley Fool. If you're looking for even more great stock ideas, go to our special link. Go to fool.com forward slash unscripted. The Motley Fool is going to give you its 10 best stocks to buy right now. Okay, Tyler, so let's do a little bit of history first. And I want to go even further back than the founding of Tellurian. And let's talk about Sharif Suki, the co-founder of Tellurian. This was his second go around, his second attempt. Yeah. And he's been dubbed the father of U.S. LNG exports. I'm going to try to do the fastest breakdown I can of the history of Sharif Suki and natural gas. Basically, Sharif Suki was a entrepreneur who early on built a natural gas import facility because prior to the shale boom, we thought we were going to be drastically short jet natural gas in the United States. Fast forward through shale and all of a sudden he looked at it and said, oh man, this thing's going to be a fossil in six months. And so they pivoted and tried to make it into a natural gas export facility. The thing was a financing nightmare. It barely got built by the skin of its teeth. It took on billions upon billions of debt. It did some very convoluted financing mechanisms of spinning out the facility as a master limited partnership, and then actually had a separate version of the stock. It, it, it had been split three or four different ways just to try to build this one facility. It finally got built. And Shuri Suki was a go-go, one to build the next one, one to build the next one, one to expand, one to dominate natural gas exports in the United States. And activist investors said, stop, slow down. We actually have a profitable business here. Let's stop spending so much money. And he got ousted as the CEO and I think executive chairman at Chenier when he was the, one of the majority shareholders. Activist investor Carl Icahn was a key figure and ousting Suki from the company that was his brainchild, his baby that he created and built. I think one of the reasons people are so interested in Tellurian, you and I included, going back to when our f initial interest in the business, this is Chenier Energy stock going back to 2010. And you look at the chart and you're like, oh, wow, this was a huge success. And yes, it has been a monster winner, but hindsight bias makes it pretty easy to miss. Like you said, almost didn't make it. And again, you're charting the stock price, you see the blue line percentage off of highs. There's a reason this stuff fell some 80% back in, in early 2016. And that was the time that Suki got pushed out the door. The bottom line is that massively successful, still huge global demand. So we can yeah. pivot to talking about Sh Sh uh, Tellurian yep. and its, its birth. Go ahead. What happened was Suki basically was like, all right, I'm going to do this again. And decided to create Tellurian, which was going to be another natural gas export facility in the United States. Actually, it sounded like a really good idea, right? This guy had already done it once. He can do it again. So I think there was a lot of initial excitement. I was initially excited. I, I was like, I can get on the ground floor of another chenier because you look, yeah, I know he had his struggles, but he pulled it off. And so I, I was big on it. There's a book I encourage people to read called The Frackers. Remember The Frackers? You've read that book? Yes. Yes. Um, I actually got, interviewed um, Jeffrey Zucker, the author or Motley Fool a long time ago. So the, uh, Sharif Suki is one of the one of the key figures in the book that Zuckerman profiled, and it's a great book. And I encourage you to go to find it and read it. It really breaks down the whole story of what happened. And the thing that was really compelling to me about Tellurian was, and, and this is what I bought hook, line, and sinker, Tyler, and I think a lot of us did too, was not just that Suki had done it, but the idea that maybe he had learned some lessons along the way, some important lessons about what could be done better, what could you change, what would you do differently. And, and that was a would, really compelling thing. And you wouldn't be burdened with this existing facility that you financed with debt that was basically useless. So fresh start, it sounded great. And yep. I, I think a lot of people were on board. Let's break down what the original thesis was. I think it's really important as a starting yeah. point. So the idea, so, Driftwood going to be built with proximity to a lot of the really high growth shale that was oil with some gas, some natural yes. gas that was coming up, but there wasn't existing gas infrastructure in place, right? Right. They were going to get pipes in there to that stranded gas and be able to 
have access to gas potentially below market prices from oil producers that had this strand of gas that it was basically going to be found money for them. That was the idea of a big part of the central thesis of doing it. And at the same time, they were going to, they were going to fund the facility through a combination of long-term contracts, take or pay contracts, but also joint ventures where they were going to have some equity interest from like large integrated oil and gas companies were going to make equity investments. They were going to own a portion of the facilities, but the majority was going to be left over for Tellurian and Tellurian's investors. And at the time, if you read the filings and if you follow the potential cash flows and you looked at as a potential model for valuation, if they pulled it off roughly directionally with what they were proposing to do, the stock had 50x potential. Here yeah. we are now, the stock thinks maybe less than a dollar share. This is where it went sideways, I think, largely, is that one of the reasons that they were able to get Chenier done is because they locked up these really long fixed price contracts to basically says, look, we're not going to take any risk on commodity prices. We're going to just basically sell this volume to people and sell almost the entirety of production on contracts that are going to last 20 years. So when you could go to bankers with your finance and be like, look, these guys are guaranteed to buy it. They have take or pay contracts, which means they're going to take it rather than whether they want it or not. And they're going to have to pay us the fee to process it. So there was like some modicum of safety built into was a risky development thing, because if it did get, if it did get built, that was like a guaranteed stable cash flow, which debt investors love. Tellurian didn't want to do that. They were like, we want to do this as equity partners, and we don't want to take on as many of these contracts. We want to sell to the spot market because we think selling to the spot market basically means instead of having a co agreed contract price, sell it to somebody who needs it today. Trying to play the difference between natural gas prices in the United States versus Europe versus Asia. Sounds attractive. It's very uncertain. And when you are trying to lock down billions of dollars in financing in debt, bankers want to see steady cash flow. They want to know that there is going to be revenue coming in the door. And that they was, want certainty. They want predictability. And the right. model that, like you said, the model that, that, that they were trying to put in place simply didn't provide that. And it really became an issue, Tyler, not with the bankers, but with the potential equity partners, because yep. we saw some equity partners line up. We saw, I believe, Shell, Total Energies partnered up with them. She uh, Shark Industries. There was a lot of suppliers mm -hmm. that were good at getting on board. And also these, yep. there are very large trading houses, basically people who move commodities mm -hmm. around the world. One of them is called Governor. The other one is VTOL. I think the, the other th third is Triad Fergo. They're like the three biggest in the world. But those first two, they had signed deals with them. And those deals, they just eventually walked away because it was unreliable. Yeah. There weren't enough of these deals to get to a point where they could actually move forward, call in the capital, pay Bechtel to start building it, and begin moving forward with construction. So again, we've laid this background. We've talked about the thesis, what it was. We've talked about what sounded more optimized, but nobody went for, right? Some people, some started to, but nobody getting out the checkbook, right? We saw lots of hands being shaken, but nobody started writing checks. And along the way, we saw multiple changes in management. We saw Sharif Suki, again, who's co-founded the business with Martin Houston, longtime oil and gas industry executive, who most of his, spent most of his career on natural gas as a big part of his entire career. They were running the board, so overseeing the vision of the company, but never day-to-day -day operational roles with the business. They were always on the board. And we've seen a litany of heavy hitters come through as CEO. Again, it just seems like there was never any nothing ever really substantially moved forward. They got all the permits in place. Sharif Suki, we saw him, I guess it's probably a couple of years ago now, maybe during the pandemic, started to become more of a public face of the company again, doing YouTube videos, these regular notes he was writing to try and appeal more to in investors. Fast forward to December. I think this is where we need to pick the story up. What started to really change for the company? In November, he was, there was a, a shakeup at the board and he was no longer the executive chairman. They had a separation agreement. Martin Houston took over as the executive chairman. Suki kept his board for about a month. And then in December, they agreed to a separation agreement and he's no longer part of the board of directors again. Just like a Chenier, Suki is out again. He still has a lot of money involved in the company, but he doesn't have any say as a board member in the direction of this company anymore, any more so than common shareholders where the shares that he owns, he can vote on those, but that's about it. Martin Houston, again, one of the co-founders is now in as chairman of the board of the company. 
they made some other changes to the board with Suki leaving the board and filling that vacant position. So here we are, a reconstituted board. Some other things have changed with the businesses because they actually do have a little bit of cash flows going. One of the things they started to do in recent years is actually acquire and start operating gas wells, producing natural gas to try to drive some revenue. Still a really small business. My question for you, I don't think you're still a a Tellurian shareholder. Tyler's not. He's shaking his head no. I still own some shares, not a significant position at all. My question for you is what's next? What happens to Tellurian going forward? What is it going to take for the business to get turned around? I see two paths, really, for this to be a success. The first one, I think, is management comes out and says, hey, all of that new equity financing, spot market arbitrage, all that stuff. No, we're going to throw it all out. We are going to run the Chenier playbook. We are going to go lock up a bunch of long-term contracts, fix prices, fix fees. We're going to do it the same way. That, and it's how we got all the financing for Chenier. That's how we're going to get to it again. If that, if they do, that could work. The other thing they can do is, is go to a bunch of large developers or large natural gas producers in the United States or somebody that's got a boatload of money and needs to spend it on something and say, hey, are you trying to develop a natural gas export facility, but you don't have your permits yet, or you don't have a location set down or all that stuff? Hey, guess what? We got a shovel ready project right now, ready to go. All you can do is buy us. And you can cut to the front of the line and Bechtel is ready to go. All you got to do is sign a check. And I I think those are the two things. If the former happens, I might sniff at it. Obviously with interest rates a lot higher than they are, that's not as attractive of a proposal as it used to be, but I'd kick the tires on it a little bit, at least and see what the the financials would look like in that regard. But I, I don't, I can't think of another option as to how this actually works. In my opinion, those are the kind of the two outs that the company has right now. Yeah, I think you're, I think you're right. And, and I do think I agree with you. I think the optimal outcome for investors is actually figuring it out, raising the capital, whether it's debt or whatever the mechanism it is, obviously doing secondaries right now is off the table with the stock price where it is. But somehow being able to meaning, raise meaningful capital to move forward as a standalone company would be great. But it's going to be hard to do that. With the, the state of the business, the state of the cash flows, where their balance sheet is, it's going to be challenging. I, I will say that moving Suki off of the board or Suki moving himself off the board, however you want to define it, whichever is the real answer, I think it does clear the path a little bit for potential for a potential buyer to come in. But the real question is going to be, what is the premium going to be? I think it would be a definite premium to the current share price, but I don't know how much. And I don't th- know that the probabilities are high enough that it's worth investing in this as like a special situation takeout candidate. But there could be some decent upside for investors willing to risk that. But I don't think you can count on that being being your exit strategy and a guaranteed profitable payday. 